of coffee, sit back and listen to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life features stories to inspire and motivate you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Visit CYACYL.com. Good morning, this is Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Today's guest, Greg Braden, has searched the mountain villages, remote monasteries, and forgotten texts to discover the timeless secrets that bridge science and spirituality. Greg is a New York Times bestselling author whose work is featured on the History Channel, the Discovery Channel, the Sci-Fi Channel, ABC, and NBC. To date, Greg's discoveries have led to such books as The Isaiah Effect, The God Code, The Divine Matrix, and Fractal Time, which debuted in 2009 at number five on the New York Times bestseller list just two weeks after its release. His new his book is entitled Deep Truth, Igniting the Memory of Our Origin, History, Destiny, and Fate. Deep Truth reveals new discoveries that change the way we think about everything, from our personal relationships to civilization itself. Good morning, Greg. Thanks so much for joining us today. Good morning, Joan. I am thrilled to be on this program. Greg, you're a scientist, and you were a computer geologist for Phillips Petroleum and a senior computer systems designer with Martin Marietta and the first technical operations manager with Cisco Systems. So yeah. as a scientist, science and spirituality don't usually blend. So what was it that led you on your spiritual journey? Oh, you know, you're going to start with the easy questions first. <laughs> <laughs> Joan, that question comes to be often in the terms of what led me to what many people see as a quantum leap mm -hmm. from a world of science and technology and into uh, our most cherished and ancient and sacred traditions uh, of, of spirituality. And I guess the first time I, I heard the question, I was surprised because for me, it was less of a leap and more of a, a logical progression. It was the next step. Uh, I was born and raised in a, a, a relatively conservative community in the Midwest, in Kansas City, Missouri, in the northern part of the state. And it's something people didn't talk about much outwardly, but I always assumed that everyone kind of believed the same thing. And that was that when we study science, when we study geology, biology, physics, chemistry, what we're really doing are studying little pieces of a much bigger puzzle of the, the inner workings of, of the universe that is the basis for the world's spiritual traditions. Uh, and I just thought everybody kind of thought that way. And it wasn't until I got into the corporations, uh, I found out nothing could be further from the truth, that there was uh, a belief that the, the two are mutually exclusive, that we must either follow the path of science or the path of spirituality. So it was, I'll just be very honest, it was during a, a very frightening time in the history of the world uh, when I was working in the defense industry during the last years of the Cold War. Uh, behind the scenes, Joan, it was one of the most frightening times where the superpowers were prepared to do the unthinkable and release nuclear weapons on civilian populations um, if, the, if they perceived the threat arose. My thinking, working in that industry, my thinking was simply this. Science and spirituality, we've been led to believe that they're mutually exclusive. What would happen if we married them together? What if we took the best science of today that tells us how things work and we married that with 5,000 years of human experience and spiritual traditions that tell us how to apply those principles in our lives? What if we married them both into a wisdom that was greater than either could be individually? Would that help us to avoid the kinds of wars that we saw in the 20th century and, and now that we're seeing in the 21st century? Uh, and that question has led me on the journey that you described in the interview into some of the most ancient, remote, pristine traditions, the mountain villages, the monasteries, the texts, the traditions of our past, to understand what our ancestors may have known in their time that we're only beginning to understand in ours that, that can help us uh, deal with the crises that we face in our, in our world today. So it's a long answer to a short question, but it'll lay the foundation for, for everything else that we'll do here. Greg, one of the things that really amazes me, is you're talking about the marriage of science and spirituality. When you think about our modern medicine today, I, I'm amazed every time I hear a doctor tell a cancer patient, your attitude or your, your emotional health has no impact on whether or not you're going to be healed from your cancer. So why is it that we still have that train of thought in our scientific world today? Well, this is uh, precisely what the, the new book, Deep Truth, is, uh, is about just that. It is about a number of 
scientific assumptions, uh, some of them over 300 years old. Science began about 300 years ago during the time of Isaac Newton. And there are key scientific assumptions, Joan, that our lives are built upon, our civilization is built upon, the way we treat one another, the way we, we feel about our relationship to our body that you've just mentioned, uh, about our relationship to the earth, uh, our relationship to, to the economics uh, of, of our planet. And those assumptions the false assumptions have led to the crises that we are experiencing today. And the best minds of our time are telling us very clearly that this generation and these years of our lives, early in the 21st century, we are living the greatest number of crises ever to face a single generation in 5,000 years of human history. And each crisis is of the greatest magnitude. And each of these crises, whether we're talking about the depletion of, of resources like fresh water and food, or we're talking about the need to adapt to climate change, uh, we're talking about the economic collapse that we are all experiencing right now. These are examples of crises that, that stem from following a path. They're the consequences of false assumptions of science. So the new book is identifying the new peer-reviewed discoveries that tell us these assumptions are false so that as we work together to solve the problems of our time, we don't use the same thinking that led to the problems. So this is uh, what you're describing with a cancer patient is one example of one of the false assumptions uh, is that we've been led to believe that we are separate from the earth, uh, separate from our body, and that the things that we think, feel, and emote inside have very little consequence uh, on what happens beyond our, our emotions. And it is changing. It's beginning to change. However, it is not embraced in the mainstream. These changes are not embraced in the mainstream medical community in the West. Other traditions do embrace them, and uh, I've had the opportunity to, to study those traditions. They respect the role of thoughts, feelings, and emotions to actually regulate the chemistry of the human body. And interestingly, only in the last eight years or so, Western science now is validating those relationships. And the term they're using is called epigenetics. Epigenetics is the, the science now that is showing us that human emotion, heart-based emotion, uh, has the, the ability to, to actually regulate the way that DNA and genes express in our bodies. And the implications of that are huge, and that's just one, one of the false assumptions uh, that we deal with. And Dr. Bruce Lipton was on the show a while back to talk about that. But, Greg, does all of this go back to the fact that they have a better understanding that everything is made of energy? Possibly, Joan. I think it goes back to this is the, the whole premise of, uh, of, of the book. Science is – I was trained as a scientist. I believe in science. I think science – has served us, and science does not have all the answers. It's a relatively young way of exploring and knowing our world. It's only 300 years old or so. So the question is, what happened before science? Did we know anything? And the answer is, of course, we knew a lot. In the 5,000 years of recorded human history, we had a very different way of thinking about our, ourselves and our relationship to our world and, and our bodies. This is the key. They didn't separate us from the world and our bodies. I don't know if they thought, thought about it so much as, as energy, Joan, but they recognize the interrelated nature, the interconnected nature of life with our environment. And that's something we're just now beginning to, to really embrace in our time today. That brings me to something called collective emotion. What is that and, and what type of impact does that have in our world around us? Collective emotion, what, what our own science now is showing us, and I, my sense, Joan, our time's going to go by so quickly today. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go back to uh, uh, September 11th, 2001, when we all know the, the tragedy that, that struck in, in New York City and, and Washington. What a lot of people don't know about that, however, is that satellites 22,000 miles above the surface of the Earth were recording magnetic fields of the Earth. They, they do this, and they send a, a data back every 30 minutes to the scientists of the Earth. It was during precisely the time that these attacks were occurring that the magnetic fields of the Earth experienced this tremendous spike that was uh, unusual. Uh, actually, it was unprecedented. The scientists had never seen anything like this before. And to make a long story very brief, it led to a series of studies showing that it was the, the mass emotion of hundreds of millions, possibly even billions of humans responding in the, uh, the uh, window of time, in the same window of time to the events of 9-11, what they were seeing on their televisions, that the heart-based response 
the magnetic fields of so many human hearts coupled with the magnetic fields of the earth and actually increased the, the strength of these fields for a period of time. Uh, and we all remember how close we felt to one another. The term is called coherence. There's a tremendous coherence that swept the earth as people responded with an outpouring of heart-based human emotion, care, sadness, shock, disbelief. But the key was they were all heart-based emotions. And this has led scientists now on a, a new path of study, uh, exploring the power of this relationship between the human heart and the magnetic fields of the earth, the magnetic fields of the human heart, and the feelings and emotions that we create that actually link us, they couple us to these magnetic fields of the earth in very healthy, very healing ways. And where this comes full circle is what they've found, is that the, the heart-based emotions that create the most beneficial effects to humans are the emotions that are at the core of our most cherished spiritual traditions that we find in those monasteries and the texts in, in the, uh, some of the, the most remote regions of the world today that have been untouched by the modern thinking. So there, there is a connection between us and, and the earth, and this is precisely what, uh, what Deep Truth is all about. Greg, we have to take a break now. When we return, I'm going to ask Greg to talk to us about the five false assumptions of science. This is Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman, and our guest today is New York Times bestselling author and speaker, Greg Braden. Greg, before break, I had mentioned that I was going to ask you to talk about the five false assumptions of science. What are these assumptions, and what impact does it have to us in our lives? Joan, there are, are probably many false assumptions of science. These are five key assumptions that I've identified in, in the book, Deep Truth, because they all create the lens through which we see ourselves and our relationship to the world, and it's the way we think of ourselves that determines how we solve the problems of our world. Every one of these is, uh, is taught in mainstream public schools today. So the first false assumption, number one, is about evolution. It's a Darwinian assumption, is that evolution explains life in general and human life specifically. The second false assumption is that civilization began only about 5,000 years ago in the time of, of ancient Sumeria uh, in the Mesopotamian area. False assumption number three is that consciousness is somehow separate from our physical world. False assumption number four is related to, to number three. It's that the space between things is empty. So the space between uh, the nucleus of an atom and the first electron is empty, or the space between you and the person sitting next to you is empty. And false assumption number five, and this is the one I'm going to zero in on, it, and it is another Darwinian assumption, is that nature is based upon what Darwin called survival of the strongest. Survival of the strongest. This has played such a, a powerful role in our lives. It was introduced in 1859. And it was the first scientific attempt, Darwin's ideas were the first scientific attempt to identify human relationships with the world. So his ideas were accepted quickly, they were entrenched deeply, and they play a powerful role in our lives today. Because the belief is that nature is based on a model of competition rather than cooperation. And if we want to see the result of where that thinking leads, we need look no further than the, the collapse of the economic system of the world, the collapse of business models in the Western world, the way we're solving the problems of diminishing resources. Uh, where we know that this is a false assumption is that in peer-reviewed mainstream scientific journals, scientists are now saying that this is not the case at all. And I, I just wanted to share a couple of examples in, in the the, uh, the journal, the very prestigious journal, New Scientist, April 2008, Michael LePage, what he says is what we see in the wild is not every animal for itself. Cooperation is an incredibly successful survival strategy. When cooperation breaks down, the results can become disastrous. So there's a, a, a line of thinking now that is overturning this idea that, that struggle is the basic nature of, uh, of our existence. And this plays a tremendous role as we go about solving the greatest crises of recorded human history. If we try to solve them through the, the lens that leads us to believe that competition, struggle, and the, the strongest survive is the way to, to solve our problems, we know where that's going to lead because we're already experiencing those, those problems right now. So I think it's key 
It's paramount that we embrace the new discoveries that are overturning this particular false assumption and the other false assumptions that I've shared as well. Every one of them, peer-reviewed scientific evidence accepted in their respective communities is now overturning every one of those assumptions that that I just shared. And uh, I think it's key that we allow our young people access to these new discoveries, at least let them know that they exist, so that as our young people go about solving the problems of our world today, they have the full palette, all of the tools of discovery, rather than being required to see the world through the lens of the false assumptions of uh, of the past hundred years or so. So, Greg, we understand this very important false assumption, and we understand that the importance of the spirit of cooperation and achieving maximum coherence. So what would you say, what is your advice to help us to, to strive to achieve what we need to do, how we can change the world by treating each other with the spirit of cooperation? Well, there, it's a very good question. There are, are, are many ways to, to go about doing it. I think one of the keys is for us to understand that our individual choices in everyday life pool together to become the collective answer to the way that we deal with the problems in our world. So in other words, how do we treat one another personally each day in our lives? How, how do we treat people on the freeway you know, as we're going to work or the, the people that service our, our meals in the restaurant or the people that we work with uh, in our uh, academic or the, the, in the workplace or, or the family dinner table? Those seemingly insignificant moments where we've been conditioned to compete because we've been led to believe that the, the outcome is more important than what we become in getting to the outcome. We've been led to believe in our schools that the answer is more important than the excellence that allows us to develop an understanding of how we get to the answer. So uh, on a personal basis, every day in our lives, we make a choice, consciously or subconsciously, to either contribute and help one another make this a better world, or the bottom line is if we can ask ourselves a simple question, rather than asking, what can I get from the existing world today, if we can shift that slightly to say, what can I offer to the world that's emerging? If we can make that subtle shift, I think all kinds of ideas come up for us as individuals in terms of how we can contribute to the new cooperative ways of, of living. Now, on, on the huge level, Joan, the same scientists that identified that the magnetic fields were affected by human hearts after 9-11 uh, have also found that when many people come together creating heart-based coherence, it actually creates uh, a field effect that is measurable in many parts of the earth. And in this effect, we are more likely to work together, more likely to cooperate to solve our problems. Uh, can I just give a quick illustration of what I mean by that? Sure. Uh, right after 9-11, I was actually, I was teaching a, a workshop, a seminar for about 3,500 people in a, uh, a conference room in, um, it was a ballroom in Paris. And there was a, a French man in the audience who was very angry about something, and I, I didn't know what it was. And security came in, and immediately they wanted him to leave the room. And I believe there are no accidents. So I said, you know, you can ask him to step into the hall and, and wait there for just a few minutes, and then bring him back into the room. And while he was in the hallway, we led this room of 3,500 people through a series of coherence, heart-brain coherence exercises of, of creating very precise heart-based experiences for three minutes. It was only three minutes. We brought the man back into the room and gave him a microphone and asked him to share with us his experience as he came back into the room. And it was very, very odd what happened because he had this look on his face. And what he said through the translator, he said that he knew in his mind why he was angry, but he could not feel the anger. He couldn't access the anger in his emotions, in his heart. And that is a beautiful illustration for one room full of people. When a room full of people creates a field of coherence, it influences. It doesn't control, it doesn't manipulate, but it influences the experience of those who are not in that coherence. What's possible for that room, scientists now believe is possible for a planet. When many people come together to create heart-brain coherence, 
It's very, very difficult to declare war on your neighbor, and it's much more likely that we will work together to cooperate, to adapt, and help people dealing with climate change, rather than competing and trying to make some countries pay for the, the climate change. It really doesn't help the lives of those who are suffering. Or the diminishing resources, the diminishing food, the diminishing water, the sharing of the medicine, the sharing of the technology. So coherence is good for us on a personal level. It's good for our immune systems. Uh, we think better. We function better. Anti-aging hormones kick into high gear in the presence of coherence. Personally, now the studies show that those effects extend beyond our bodies into the fields that connect all life. Collectively, coherence is good for us in terms of peace and cooperation. So what we do in our personal lives actually contributes to this greater field. The book is Deep Truth, Igniting the Memory of Our Origin, History, Destiny, and Faith by Greg Braden. If you'd like more information about Greg, you can visit his website, which is gregbraden.com. And as always, you can visit our website, which is cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on our website, listen to past shows as podcasts, read the digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, and now take part in the CYACYL book club. Greg, thank you so much for spending time with us. We absolutely have to have you come back. I haven't even scratched the surface of questions that I have for you. The time just seemed to fly. So thank you again so much for being here. Joan, thank you for your dedication to creating this kind of programming and, and your vision that makes it possible and just for being such a gracious host today. I appreciate you tremendously. This is Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.